year and a half ago, a friend of mine came to me. We worked together in the past. And he says, I want to build a startup. I want to do something. Do you have an idea what? So he harassed me, and he came back, and he asked for several weeks. And in the end, I told him, you know, WebRTC, do something about testing because of this minor fact. So people don't test WebRTC today. And that's the current situation that we're at. OK? How many of you here have been the kind of a system in the past? You know, done something? OK. Have you actually tested it? OK. So you did. And this is probably the kind of testing that you did. You tested manually. You had three people in the office, one of them using his own Chrome browser. You're using the same. You told the other one to use Firefox just to check that everything's working. And then you said, yes, that's fine. It's working. Now, the next thing that happens, you go send someone out to do it from home, and then nothing works. Because then you remember that you need to put a turn server in place, or a stand server even. And that's how things go with WebRTC. I go to a company, ask them, OK, you know, I need to use your service. How many people can it, can it hold? They say, well, 100 people. Now, I'm, I know that they test manually, and they're not that big. So I ask them, with how many have you tested it? And then the answer is, well, we got up to 12, because that's the amount of machines we had in the office. OK, so that's a huge issue. And the problem is that why do people do that? Why test manually? If you look at any other thing in software development, I went and searched Google, and there are you know, a bunch of 100 million, 103 million results for test automation. If you search for that, you see that everyone is doing test automation, but it almost doesn't happen in WebRTC. Now, there are reasons for that. I don't want to go over them. What I do want to do is to talk with you about what we've done at TestRTC and the challenges that we had and how we solved them in order to build a test automation platform for WebRTC. And I'm going to go over seven different suggestions of what you should take care of. And we'll start off with the fact that if you want to do something with status automation for WebRTC, third, third, first thing to do is to forget that it's voice over IP. And what do I mean by that? You need to rely on the browser, nothing else. OK? People are going to enter into your service either through your browser or even a mobile app that was built on the WebRTC stack that comes with the browser. And if you look here, you'll see that there are many different browser versions. and you have a new one every six or eight weeks. And they break. Each time something comes out, something breaks. Either because it got deprecated, or because it wasn't tested by the browser or someone forgot. So the first thing to do, make sure that whatever you do, you build your test automation around the browser. It will make it a lot easier for you to do regression testing when you move on. And the way, best way to do it today, Selenium. Right, OK? Everybody here knows what Selenium is? OK, so I don't need to explain. But just for those that don't, if you want to do any kind of automation inside the browser, go check for Selenium. It's open source. It's great. It's working. So that's one. The second thing is, if you are testing WebRTC, don't test only the stable version. Make sure that you at least test all to the beta version. All browser vendors today offer the version that is in the market. So Chrome probably now is 49, what we have on your laptops. OK? But we already know that 50 is down the road. So if you go and search for Chrome beta, you'll get version 50. It's not final, but that's what your service is going to hit. So one thing that you need to do in your testing is to test both the current version, the stable one, and the beta version. OK? Make sure you test multiple such versions. Otherwise, once the version is out at the market, you need to go fix bugs on your side because Chrome broken things that you've done earlier and expected to be there. Second thing, when you start to automate the browser, one thing that you need to do is to throw the camera and the microphone. You need to replace them with something virtual. Now, the browsers allow you to do that. Chrome has this nice command line of use the fake device for media stream and then use file for fake video capture. You give it a Y4M file. It's the stupidest file ever. It's just the whole video is in there, everything. It's not compressed. That's how you run it. But you cannot use FFmpeg to create it. 
there's a minor bug in Chrome that if you do that, it crashes. And for that purpose, you just need to call, after you call FM, FFmpeg to convert an MP4 file into Y4M file, you need to call this command line of SED to remove four characters from this one gigabyte of file that you will get to make it run. Okay, so if the browser crashes, the first thing you do, go do that. There are details here of how to do that. Second thing is the audio. If you are going to use the same audio used for the video, it doesn't work because the video is going to loop. Okay, you give it a one minute video, you run the call after the one minute, the video restarts itself automatically. Everything's great, but your audio doesn't. Now, Google has this great reason of why this has happened, something to do with acoustic gain control inside the browser. I couldn't care less, it just doesn't work. So what you need to do now is take that file that you have for the audio, the WAV file, and increase it. You need to loop it by yourself, so the file will be a lot lo larger for that. In order to do that, you can just call again, I'm on the, yes, call again that, that line, okay? That FFmpeg, and then the for loop there to create a larger file. Third thing is you need to take care of the network. We started by the fact that, well, things don't work because you move home, and then the second thing that won't work is what happens when there are packet loss or latencies or things like that. So you need to be able to test that and automate that, the network impairment. Take a picture at the end of this line because it's filling in. The second thing would be firewall configurations. You need to be able, these browsers that you are automating, to work and to force turn relays and to force them with TCP or with TLS and do these kinds of things. The best way to do these two things is by using netfilter.org IP tables. They have a package there, you use it, you configure the Linux the way you want it, and it just works. It takes a bit of hacking, but that, that's how you do it. Now, the third problem, and this happened to me in India, it's that, you know, you get a company, they come and say, we used an, a SaaS platform, but nothing works, we can't get good audio out of it, or good media out of it. I even heard that as a question now today. And the reason is that <coughs> you need to use different locations. And almost none of the uh, SaaS players today that provide WebRTC support work from India, which means that in most cases you're on your own in working in India. But if you're trying to work for multiple locations and do it globally, you need to take sure, make sure that you virtualize things and you put it in different data centers. What we found out that barebone works best, virtualiz virtualizations, if you want to put the browser in there and run it and get the most stuff out of it, usually gets crappy. Okay, and the focus that we had at least was stability and throughput in there. So go check Barebone. It's your best friend if you want to do that for browser testing automation. Next problem that we have, once you take Selenium and you run it, you need to think about your use case. What happens there? Is there someone that calls someone else? Do they meet in the same URL? Are there a group of people that do that? Is it like Badri said before, we have on stage, off stage, people that can talk, people that can't. Do someone needs to sign up? Is it a contact center with different tangents and queuing? So you need to be able to synchronize these browsers when they go to get automated, okay? So again, take that and bear that in mind. Now, visualize. You need to visualize what it is that you're doing. I just, you know, took WebRTC internals, took the JSON file, placed it here, and anyone knows where the problem is? Okay, that's what you get. You can download it, you can send it to a developer, and he'll, I don't know, do something with it. Now, you take the same thing, and you start visualizing it. And this is what you get. This is from a post I did about a month ago. Chrome came out with VP9 support under a flag, a command line flag. I decided to run it through the system and see what happens. So the first one, I took Chrome with VP8. You know, you see the bitrate, it's nice. Packets, everything looks great. I took Chrome VP9, and now this is what you see for VP9. Okay? Do you see a problem? There is a difference here, and there are two things that you can note. The first one, VP8 gets to the 
bit rate that it can use quite fast, within five seconds. DP9 takes 30 minutes to get there, but then it's very flaky. It doesn't really stay stabilized at that point. Now, the reason isn't because VP9 isn't good. It's just because the implementation is new. And if you wait for Chrome 51 or 52, I'm sure that what you'll see is that this is going to improve, because that's important for those that are building video codecs that need to work in real time. OK? So once you start taking the data that your browsers give you through GetStats, and you try to look at it and visualize it, you can see very interesting things. I'll show you two more. OK, that's the packet loss tables that we have, again, from that same GetStats information. What you see here is a spike of 6,000 packet losses at the beginning of a call, which is impossible, especially since the call is just a minute and a half. And that means something like 6,000% packet loss. OK, this works with a specific MCU that we've tested. And the problem is that it just sends that information over RTCP when it starts. So a bug. That's an additive, different type of MCU. You've got spikes of hundreds of packet losses every 10 seconds. Again, just doesn't make sense. Now, it might be fine, and the service might just work fine, but the browser might not necessarily like that. And that might cause you fluctuations with the video because he gets these kinds of feedback, and then he's going to do things about it. Okay? And you cannot get through that without actually seeing it. Nobody will look there in the file inside this long text file that you get to search for these kinds of problems. So whatever it is that you do when you automate, visualize it as well. This will help you with the debugging processes later on. Another thing is what are your expectations from the test? Should it work? How many challenges should, should be there? Is the audio, you expect audio on the incoming channel or not at all? Should there be two video outgoing channels? OK? These are things that we heard that people complain about. So we wanted these things solved. So solve it on your side as well. Just don't just automate the execution of the test, but also the ability to validate that the things that you expect happen there. Now, last but not least, collect everything. There is a lot of data available there. When you automate, collect that. So if there is a bug, you can send it to the developer and tell him, you know, it went wrong. Now fix it. OK? It includes the WebRTC internal dump. Get that. Make sure to get the console logs from the browser. So from example, we collect that. We look at the warnings and the er errors. And a lot of these services, you go, you see, you know, you get 20 different errors of deprecation. That means that your service is going to break the next time or two or three versions from now. So you might as well change the APIs that you're using. Media recordings, get these as well. Someone can hear them. You can try to calculate MOS or do other things with it. Again, Chrome enables now, so use that capability and collect that. And also collect the machine performance to understand what your service does to the actual browser locally. What happens there? Because you might be putting too much CPU on that, and then it just breaks when your users are going to use it on different types of laptops. You've probably got the best because you're developers. That might not be the end users. So what I wanted to say here is don't take WebRTC testing lightly. If you are building a service, make sure that you test it, and make sure that you don't only test it manually, but also automate this part of the service and the testing of it. <coughs> if you're interested, you can go into testrtc.com and check what